I want to talk to you tonight about eternity. Where you will spend eternity. The scripture declares, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this comes the judgment. What the scripture is talking about here is the fact that one day, every single one of us, every single person who's hearing this message will pass from this life into the next. You one day will die. Now, we don't like to think of our mortality. We would rather push that into the back of the mind, go on living and hope that it actually never happens to us. And I think that as humans, we have the tendency to avoid those uncomfortable truths. But the reality is still there, and truth remains even if all cease to believe it. The reality is that one day you will die. And the scripture says that when you die, you're going to stand before a holy God and you're going to give an account of your life to him. You see, he gave you breath. He gave you existence. He gave you movement and animation. He gave you life. The scripture says that in him we live and move and have our being. God created you. God formed you. You did not arrive on this planet by accident. There is a purpose to your existence. And when God formed you and created you, he did so with intent. For everything that is created with intention has purpose. Everything that is created with intention has purpose. And that includes you. What was the purpose for which God created you? It's quite simple. He created you to glorify Him. He created you to love Him and be loved by Him. Wonderful, merciful, loving God created you to experience His goodness. Here's the reality, though. One day, all of us, both believer and unbeliever alike, will face a form of judgment or another. The question is, will you be able to say to him when you stand before your creator that you live according to his purpose? Are you ready to stand before God? Are you ready to face your maker? Are you ready to give an account for your life to your creator? The value of your life the sacredness of your life was given to you by him. Now, Revelation chapter 19 says this. I just heard the Holy Spirit move me in a different direction. Go instead to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Hmm. Wow. The Bible says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. What does that mean? It means that every single one of us have violated the standard that God has given us to live by. Now, I often use this analogy, but imagine, my friend, that I give to you. We go out in the parking lot after the service, and we pick you out of the crowd, and I say to you, here is your brand new Ferrari or, or, or Tesla or whatever car you want, okay? You just insert what you want in there. And let's say we gift it to you. How much would you appreciate it if I told you not only have we bought you the car, but we paid the insurance for the next 10 years? 
Not only did we pay the insurance for the next 10 years, we, we gave you a lifetime supply of gasoline. And, 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 and we're going to take care of any repairs that ever happened to this. We made a deal with this shop over here. And if anything ever happens, they'll repair it for free. How many of you would just love me for that? Okay. And what if I said to you, but I just ask one thing. Please take care of it. Don't drive it off road. Don't, don't take it here into the ocean. Don't take it into the swamps. Just use it to drive on the road, get where you need to go, and enjoy it. Can you imagine someone telling me that I was being overbearing? How dare you tell me how to use the thing you gave me? I'm going to do what I want to do. I want to be free. I want to do as I wish. I want to go where I want to go. Well, this, my friend, is what we've done to the Lord who gave us life and breath. You see, he gave you a life. He gave you existence. He gave you a mind. He gave you sight. He gave you everything you have, even if you're lacking in some areas of health. There's something in this world that you consider good and worth living for. And because of that, we are held accountable for how we live. You are held accountable by how you treat, for how you treat what God has given to you. And eternity will reveal all things. When you stand before God on that day of judgment, every thought will be judged. Every word you've, you've spoken, every word will be judged. Just those two alone, some of us are already sweating. I mean, can you imagine if, if I were to somehow be able to put what's in your head in these speakers right now? Can you imagine if we were able to play on a screen the things that you do in private that you hope no one ever sees? But when you stand before God, Every thought you've ever thought of hatred, a lustful thought, things that we allow in our mind that are perverse, that are not of God, everything you've ever said to your spouse, everything you've ever said under your breath, everything you've ever spoken against God, all of it will be on full display before the sovereign eyes of God. And he's going to go down the list. Every thought, every word, every action, every interaction. And it's all going to be judged. Now the scripture tells us that on that day of judgment... They will look in what's called the book of life. And if your name is not found written in that book, the Lamb's book of life, then there's only one place that you go. You see, I don't care what society tells you. I don't care what modern Christianity tells you. I don't care what philosophers tell you. I'm telling you what the Bible tells you. And the Bible tells us of a very real heaven and a very real hell. Heaven is real. Hell is real. And those who die in their sins, without ever having had their sins pardoned, will face an eternity in hell. Now that may cause you to recoil. Wait a minute, David. Are you telling me that a loving God would send his children to hell for all of eternity? I'm telling you, yes. And the reason you're so offended by the idea of hell is because you're not offended enough at how wicked sin truly is. 
See, we don't understand just how wicked we are compared to God's holiness. But it's that bad. And it's because he is a good God, it's because he is a just God, that he chooses to pour out his wrath upon those who die in their sins. And he's justified in doing it. If I took that car away from you because you didn't take care of it, you wouldn't say I was being cruel. You would say I was being just. And we affirm our sense of justice every time we cry out for it when it comes to the things that we see happen in our society. How many times does something scroll across your Facebook feed or through a text or in a group chat and you say they need to throw the book at him. They need to send him to jail. They need to take care of him. They need to send him away. Why do you cry out for that? Because you have a sense of right and wrong. Here's the thing about human nature. When it comes to the sins of others, we cry out for justice. When it comes to our sins, we beg for mercy. So if you're offended at God for punishing sin, then you've proven the hypocrisy in your own heart when when you see wrong being done in this earth, you cry out for the justice. But we know that justice is good. We know that justice is of God. We know that punishment for wrongdoing is right. And God does punish sin. Here's, here's the thing that is, is rarely mentioned anymore. And I'm telling you this because I love you. I'm telling you this because I care. I'm telling you this because I want you to go to heaven. And that's the point of the gospel. But the reality is, is that God will hold you accountable for your actions. And there are consequences to those actions. Please understand that he's not going to wink at your sin when you stand before him on the day of judgment. He's not going to dismiss you just because your parents were good Christians and went to church. He's not going to dismiss it because you had a good personality or you had good intentions. He's going to judge that sin. And we can't work for salvation. All of our righteousness is nothing. You could go to church every day for the rest of your life. You could stop sinning today, never once again sin, do all good things, give to charity, live clean, and do things that are right, and still that would not amount to the penalty. That would still not pay off your sin. You can't work it off. It's not, it's not God, God doesn't take it and, and weigh it. It's either you've broken His standard, or you haven't. And the Bible clearly says we all have. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Because it seems like a hopeless situation. I mean, if I truly am punished for my sin, and I truly am being sent to hell for eternity because of it, how do I escape that? And that's the good news. My friend, eternity is a long, long time. And even that is a contradiction in terms. Do you understand that the scripture talks about an infinite existence after this world? A million years after you've been in eternity, there's still no less time to go. You know, one night I had a dream. And more of a nightmare, actually. And in my dream, I remember being aware, but suspended in total darkness. Nothing around me. No reference for distance. No light. No texture. No shape. Complete darkness all around. My mind existed but had no movement. And I remember sensing this deep crushing anguish. This deep crushing pain. 
this sense of suffocating, like I couldn't breathe. The nightmare lasted for maybe two minutes, but it felt much longer than that. I broke out of that. I realized that whether that dream was an exact replica of what one would face or exact experience that one would have in eternity in hell or not, it doesn't matter. Because I remember just sensing that that hopelessness that God is against you, that he's pouring out his wrath on you, the one who formed everything, pouring out wrath. And he's justified. Remember, he's justified for it. It's good that it be done. Hell is the absence of God. He is light. There is no light. He is breath. There is no breath. He is movement. There is no movement. He gave you a body. There is no body. At least not one like you would have here. Hell is the constant state of highest anguish, the point of no return. A place where one regrets every opportunity that they missed not having responded to the gospel. Why do people go to hell? It's not because God is not good. It's not because God didn't make a way. People go to hell because they're full of pride and don't want to admit their sin and turn to God. Plain and simple. I wasn't going to talk about hell. I was going to preach on, I behold, I go to prepare a place for you. The Holy Spirit shifted something here right now. I'm going to talk about the book of life. I said, Brother David, are you trying to scare people? No, I'm just telling the truth. I watch sometimes crime documentaries. I don't know what it is about it. I just love crime documentaries. I get to watch one maybe one a quarter for the year, if there's any time for it at all. But one of the things I, 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 I just become fascinated with is the reaction of the people who are standing in judgment. I've seen videos of teenagers standing before judges and receiving life sentences. I've seen old men and women receiving death penalties. I've spoken with men and women who were supposed to have spent time in prison for life, but God brought them out. And I often ask them whenever, in fact, just a couple weeks ago, I was sitting with a gentleman who was supposed to spend a really, 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 really long time in prison. And I sat with him and I asked him, I said, what was that moment like? I said, be real with me. Don't hold back. What was that moment like when you heard the judge pronounce that sentence, he described it as this deep pit in his stomach. Like he got the wind knocked out of him. Head is spinning, thinking of all the things he'll miss. But what he described as the primary sense was the sense of regret. Why, 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 why? In hell, regret is paired with hopelessness. Hell is darkness that will never again see light. Loneliness that will never again know companionship. It's hatred that will never again know love. And this is why what God did for us was so kind and so gracious and so loving. He didn't have Please hear me. He didn't have to make a way out. He was right and 
and just to punish sin. You think he needs us? He desires our fellowship. He created us for partnership. But in the sense that you and I need things, surely God needs nothing. He is self-sustaining. He needs nothing. You see, when God looked at our situation, on a people he had formed, and he saw that man became sinful, when he looks at your sins, yes, there is punishment coming one day, but the Bible says the wrath of God is being withheld until the day of judgment. Why is he doing it? Because God is a good God. And he looked down at a hopeless situation. And he looked down at you and I. And he looked down into the circumstance that you're in now. And he said within himself, because I am good. Because I am loving. Because I am merciful. I will reach down and rescue that one out of darkness. His hand is not too short that it cannot save. Does he who formed the eye not see? Or he who formed the ear not hear? God can make a way. God can rescue you. You see, nobody wants to take a cure unless they really believe they are sick. That's why we have all this craziness, vaccination debates. And I won't even say anything on that anymore because I'll split the room in half with opinions. Use it as an analogy to show that people are very hesitant to take on a cure unless they're really convinced that they're sick. That's why when you preach the gospel, and that's why I'm showing you that your situation right now without Christ does not look good. You need to know the diagnosis before you receive the prognosis. And so I'm telling you, okay, you sinned, yes. You violated God's standards, yes. There's judgment coming, yes. There's the wrath of God coming, yes. There's punishment that's due to you, yes. You cannot save yourself. That's, a, that's laughable. There's nothing you can do in your power to make up for that which you have done. There's nothing. So where do we turn? My hope is in Jesus. My hope is in the Son of God. Why? Because the Scripture says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What does that mean? I'll put it to you simply. It means that God sent His Son, Jesus, to this earth, to live a perfect, sinless life, and then die on the cross in your place, and then switch places with you. You see, when Jesus was dying on the cross, it wasn't him just dying. God was putting to death your sins. God God was punishing your sins through Jesus. God, God, God was taking the pain of Christ and bringing forth your healing. God was taking that which Christ bore on the cross and forming you as a new creation. On that cross, you switch places so that when you receive Jesus as Lord, when God looks at the cross, he sees your sin. But when he looks at you, he sees his son. Growing up, my brother and I used to play on a game console that had wires connected to it. It was the Sega Genesis. And me and my brother would play. And, you know, there were these two-player games, but when one controller wasn't plugged in, the character that the second player was supposed to play would just kind of animate itself, and the computer would play the character. I never had the heart to tell my brother. But when he was playing with me, he actually wasn't playing. I left his controller slightly unplugged, just to make sure I could make it from level to level. So he'd be playing, but he wasn't really doing anything. And if I wanted to get him to think he was doing really good, all I had to do was switch the controllers. Switch the ports. And, you know, he, he, could, he could have been falling off cliffs and dying a thousand times, but no, it looked good on his character. You see, that's what, that's what God did. He, he switched the ports on you. And so, so the offer is so simple. The offer is believe. You know why he made it so simple? Because even as simple as it is, we still mess it up sometimes. So, so you say, what do I have to do to get out of this? It's very simple. Believe. 
Put your faith in Jesus. You're basically saying, God, I'm going to take you up on that offer. For Jesus did say, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. Yeah, we'll stand and face judgment one day. But when I stand before God, it's not that I have a clean record. It's that my record's been switched. I stand before God. When he judges me, it's not going to be you did this and this and this and this and this and this and this. this. He's going to look at my scorecard. Look at me. Go, wow, perfection. Perfection. He became sin who knew no sin. That we might become the righteousness of God. I am the righteousness. Why? How do I walk confidently in that? Because I switch places with him. Say, isn't God going to punish your sin? He did punish my sin. 2,000 years ago on that cross. My sin was, was put on that cross. And so, so, you see, the hero in the story is not me saying, I'll receive salvation and do good. <laughs> no. The hero in the story is Christ saying, you couldn't save yourself. You couldn't live to my standard. But I'll come and live the standard for you, and I'll save you. Simple, simple, simple. You want to be forgiven of your sins, just put your faith in Jesus. Say, Lord, I'm going to take you up on that offer. Because your record, no matter how much you try to perfect it, that record will always have blemishes on it. And those blemishes will always require the full justice and wrath of God. Can't save myself. You can't save yourself. Only Jesus can save you. And so tonight you have a decision to make. Because you will stand before God. My question is, when you stand before God, do you want to stand holding your record? Or do you want to stand holding the record of Christ? You may think that you've gone too far. You may think that you've done too much. You may think your sin is too great. But there's no sin so wicked. There's no thought so perverse. There's no action so filthy that the blood of Jesus can't wash you whole, completely making you white and pure and holy. It's the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. That's your hope. That's your only way out. So when I stand before God, when you stand before God, don't be filled with regret. Be filled instead with hope, thankfulness, and gratitude. You can know the relief of having your sins forgiven. Aren't you so tired of carrying that burden? Aren't you so tired of knowing that something in you just isn't right? Aren't you tired of feeling separated from God, lacking in purpose, wandering aimlessly through life? You can be new. You can be a new person. You can be a new husband. You can be a new wife. You can be a new father and a mother. You can be a new son or daughter. A new person. The old thing will completely go away. Along with its old desires, old patterns, old ways of living. The scripture declares that if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things. That means everything about you becomes new. Brand new. All you have to do is turn to him. Humble yourself and turn to him. And so I'm going to make a call tonight. I'm going to challenge you to receive Christ as Lord and respond to the Holy Spirit speaking in your heart. And in a moment, I'm going to ask that everyone who wants to receive the Lord, everyone who wants to receive Jesus, I'm going to ask that you join me up here by standing at this altar. 
when you respond, know that you're not responding to me or a message or a church or a religion. You're coming to Jesus. You may have doubts. You may have questions. That's okay. Bring them to him. Bring them to the cross. Bring your sins. Bring your doubts. Bring your questions to the cross. Do you realize tonight what I'm saying? I'm saying tonight you can meet Jesus himself. You're going to meet this one we call Jesus. You're going to meet the one that so many throughout history have spoken of. He'll come to you. He'll make himself known to you. But if that's you, you say, David, I know that's me. And in your heart, you sense that drawing, watching online, you sense that pull. You know that you need to get right with God. You know your sins need to be forgiven. That's you tonight. I'm going to ask you to do something publicly. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who's in heaven. If you confess me before men, I'll, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. It's a public acknowledgement of the Lordship of Christ in your life. You're ready to turn to him, ask him to save you, and then let him be Lord of your life. Don't worry about what your group or your party or your neighbor is doing. Don't wait to see what the response is. Make it personal tonight. Be ready to have your sins forgiven. Be ready to stand before your Creator. You want to make that decision tonight. You want to ask God to forgive you. You want to make Jesus your Lord. I don't want you to hesitate. I don't want you to overthink it. I want you just to respond as you know you should. If that's you, I want you to stand up in your chair right now. Stand to your, stand to your feet all across this room. And you online, I'm going to have a challenge for you in a moment. Remain standing, those who are standing. Once again, I make this call. You see, you can only respond when the Holy Spirit is calling you. That's the beauty of having free will and God being sovereign. He'll choose the moments to call you, but you have to choose to respond. You don't know if you'll get another opportunity like this where the Holy Spirit is drawing you. So if He's drawing you, don't hesitate. This second call will be a little harder if you know you should have stood the first time and you didn't and you're having a little bit of regret in your heart right now. Just crucify that pride. Don't let your pride take you to hell. That's you. You know you need to. And I want you to stand to your feet right now. Okay, those of you who want to receive the Lord, you're standing to your feet right now. Those of you who are standing, I want you to come and join me right up here at the altar. And church, let's give the Lord honor as they come. I love it. And there's still more coming. God bless you. God bless you. This is a commitment you're making tonight. This is a commitment you're making tonight. Understand, understand that what you're doing is the beginning. This is not the end. In other words, we've been conditioned, I think, in religious thinking to imagine that we can just stand up here, say a prayer, and be done with it. It's not a prayer that saves you. They're not magic words. 
You can't just say a little prayer and go on living the way you lived. That's not in the Bible. In the scripture all throughout, you can search it front and back. You'll never find a single instance of the sinner's prayer. But you will find sinners who pray and turn to God and humble themselves. And that's all you're doing. When my daughter greets me when I come home from long trips like these, she runs up sometimes to me and she'll throw up her hands like this. Both hands like that and she'll say, Daddy, she, she wants me. When she does that with her hands, she's signaling to me that she wants me to pick her up. So what I want you to do right now is close your eyes, lift your hands, and ask him to pick you up. I want you right now to, th to be thinking about nothing but Jesus. Think of no one and nothing. He's standing before you now. He's in the room with you, ready to forgive and set you free. So what I want you to do in this moment now is I want you to repeat this prayer after me. But remember, you're not saying it to me. You're saying it to the Lord. And this prayer does not save you. Jesus saves you. But you're going to say this to him, and he's going to set you free. He's going to heal you. So I want you right now, all across the room, and church will say it with them, and we'll stand in agreement with them. I want you to say, Dear Jesus, I come to you today asking for forgiveness. I admit I have sinned. I admit I've done wrong. And Lord, I surrender. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again. I believe you are God. So Jesus, you online say it too. Say, so Jesus, take my life. Be my friend, my Lord, my God, my Savior. Wash me, cleanse me from my sins. I turn away from evil and to you. Now say, Holy Spirit, help me to live it. Holy Spirit, guide me. And I declare today, by faith, that I am, now and forevermore, born again, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Now, those of you watching online, what I want you to do is to publicly confess if you've prayed that prayer. If you asked Jesus to forgive you, if you made Jesus Savior and Lord tonight, then what I want you to do is leave two simple words on the comment section. Simply write, born again, those two words, born again. And church, I'm going to begin to see those comments coming in right now. We are so thrilled about what the Lord is doing. This is the fruit, guys. This is the fruit of ministry. What I want to do now is I want to sing a song of surrender. And you're going to surrender your life to Him. Yes, He's your Savior. Yes, He's your Lord. But you must live in that surrender. May I ask you, what are you sensing God doing for you right now? Um, 
healing. I see tears streaming down your face, my friend. That's the presence of Jesus. What is it like to have your sins forgiven? Um, to feel whole. He's here, church. Lift your hands, pray in the Holy Spirit. Just a second, please. What are you sensing happening to you right now? love that's God's love ma'am I don't know who you are where you come from but there's been such a weight over you there's been such a burden you've carried such heartache but I see Jesus with you here today you're not going to do this alone. A new creation. Sing it, Steve. I surrender all. You at this altar, lift your hands. Sing these simple words. Everyone standing across the room, please. at the comments now I'm going to read them to you as they're coming in Rachel born again Stephanie born again Hermine born again David born again Michelle born again Anderson's world born again Wilbur born again Perez born again another Rachel born again Janice born again Resurrection TV born again Okoli born again Zariah born again and and then I see Gina, born again. Casey, born again. Wendy, born again. Tapolina, born again. No, 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 born again. Maribel, born again. Kalajians, born again. Catherine, born again. Daryl, born again. Blasey, born again. Wilbound, born again. George, born again. Shirley, born again. Born again, 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 born again. Can we give Jesus a hand of praise? And I surrender all. Would you just sing it to the Lord right now? Give it all to Him. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. And I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Once more, we sing it with every. of surrender it truly is a moment of surrender Holy Spirit help us to do it help us to surrender all and fill these here tonight with your Holy Spirit and with fire give them the Holy Spirit of God give them the Holy Spirit of God Father I pray you fill them fresh 
fill her with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There's something. What are you feeling on you right now? power of God on you. Lord, fill her with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Fill her to overflowing, Lord. Fill each one, Lord, with fire from on high. God, use his life. Stretch your hands toward these, please. Use his life, Lord. Make him a man of God. Give him faith, Lord, to receive. Give him faith to receive in this moment. Touch him according to his faith, Father, in Jesus' name. His presence is here. And Lord, touch my sister. Fill to overflowing with power from on high. That's the power of God on you. Don't worry. That's the power of God. What are you sensing on you right now? Talk to me, sister. God wants to touch you. God wants to touch you. She's having a real moment with God right now. In Jesus' name, fill her, Lord, with your peace. Behold, I go prepare a place for you. Behold, I go prepare a place for you. That's his promise. That's the hope. That's the hope. That's okay. Don't apologize. Don't apologize. That's the power of God. She almost fell over and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ma'am, I promise you, I'm used to it. <laughs> Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. Lord, take her grief. Take her grief. And give her joy, Lord. This can only come by the Holy Ghost. And in my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in my heart. Bring it back here. Lord, be glorified. That's the power of God on you, buddy. There's such a sweet sense of his presence in this room right now. Just lift your hands, tell him in my heart. In my heart, Lord, be glorified today. I want to do one more thing before I dismiss these up here. I'm going to make it a little bit awkward if that's okay with you. I want you all turn around like this and face all these people looking at you. Go ahead, turn around like that and face all these people looking at you. Turn around. Church, can we welcome these to the family of God? Pam, you just attacked her with love. That was the most loving attack I've ever seen. Well, let's rejoice with them as they go back to their seats. God bless you all. <laughs> you know her, Pam? Oh, you met him in line. So there were, uh, you met her out in line. It's like you knew her for years. That was the love of God. That's the love of God in Pam right there. I love it. Around here, we're enthusiastic about souls, am I right? I love it. You may be seated. What a mighty God. That's it right there. I mean, what, what else do you need? What else do you need when the Holy Spirit is touching people like that? And, and guys, these are eternities that were changed. Not just lives changed. These are eternities that were changed. The Holy Spirit really is pleased when people turn to Jesus. Well, that's what he does, isn't it? He glorifies the Lord. He points us to him. 
He speaks of those things that Jesus spoke of. He reminds us of those things, and then he reveals certain truths to us. And this is what he does. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, just a second. Do all these people need seats, Patrick? Okay, let's, let's find them. Does anyone have an open seats next to you while we switch over to the next thing? There's a couple right here, and we ha we're having people coming in more and more, so we have to... We, we always get really creative with where we put people. And then there's, there's a guy right out here. Britain, wave your hands like crazy so they see you. There you are. So there's some seats over there, and then there we go. Come on, welcome, guys. Welcome. Welcome. I say this often when I preach the gospel. Remember when Jesus was at the well with the woman at the well, and his disciples try to bring him back food, and he says, ah, I have food you know not of. It's to do the will of my Father. I can see what he meant. You just feel so spiritually full. And really, that is one of the ways you keep the fire burning in your spiritual life. If you're wandering and you're, you're, you're drifting in your spiritual life, I encourage you to get back to the place of soul winning. That'll put a fire under you real fast. When you see people coming to the Lord, it's a beautiful thing to see what God does in their lives. And the Holy Spirit smiles on it. He smiles on it because you can sense the, the pleasure of God in this room. I've been in services. Hear me now, and I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just being honest with you. I've been in services where they went right to the prophesying or right to the miracles. That the whole service was about miracles, 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 miracles. And the power was great, but the problem was there was gifts, but no glory. There was power, but no presence. And there's the difference. I can sense the Holy Spirit in the room with us. And he's so pleased. He's so pleased. This is what we do, church. It's about souls. That's the wonderful thing about the gospel is that it doesn't just change lives, it changes eternities. And that's our mandate. That's what we're called to do as the people of God. It's to go after the lost. It's to preach the cross. And you know, we don't hear a lot of preaching on the cross anymore. We don't hear a lot of preaching on the blood. Wondering why we're waning in numbers according to some studies, I think it's because we're not preaching salvation. And salvation is what adds to our numbers. You can encourage the people. That's wonderful. But the gospel power, the Holy Spirit's power, is the difference between superficial encouragement and supernatural empowerment. It's the difference, that power. And so, church, I want to ask you to join with us in winning souls, to partner with us in what we're doing. There is no greater cause on earth than the cause of souls. For all the charities and outreaches and works that are being done, they're wonderful. And we see wonderful results in our world. But what good does it do to feed a man today who goes to hell tomorrow? What good does it do to encourage someone today who doesn't know Christ and slips into eternity without ever having received him? It's the gospel that makes the difference. Only the gospel makes a difference for eternity. And therefore, only the gospel truly makes a difference. In Matthew chapter 9, or Matthew chapter 19, forgive me, Matthew chapter 19, verse number 28. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 28. And Jesus replied, I assure you, that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He's, of course, talking to his 12 disciples, but he's speaking of eternity here. And everyone, say everyone, who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. I often question when people tell me that they're fully surrendered to Jesus, but then go and compartmentalize certain aspects of their life. It's as if they say, Lord, I'll surrender this to you, but not that. Or Lord, I'll let you 
Come far enough to bless me, but not far enough to challenge me. And it seems to me that we imagine that everything that we surrender will be pleasant. But how many know that when you get saved, there's some division that's caused? Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Meaning that because of the absolute stance that we make on Christ, there will be divisiveness. There will be these moments where we have to choose Christ over other things. And people. When I was growing up, my grandmother and grandfather were missionaries to Russia. I recall that they went in their later years to go right by St. Petersburg. There was a little city next to St. Petersburg. They weren't in their 20s or 30s or 40s. My grandparents were my grandparents at the time that they decided that we're going to go to Russia and begin a church. And they suffered for the Lord there. My grandfather broke his leg and had to go through that medical system. My grandmother was casting out demons in the hospital because a demon manifested in the doctor while he was caring for my grandfather and began to hurt his leg. And she, she rebuked him and the doctor fell backwards. But I remember wondering why they went. I remember being a little boy with my brother and my sister crying the night before we took them to the airport. And they explained again and again that in our family, we serve Jesus. I can recall my grandmother sitting me on the bathroom sink as she would comb my hair and explain to me. She would say this, and some of you might think it's crazy. Some of you might think it sounds cruel, but this is the reality. She would, as she's combing my hair very sweetly and kindly, she would say, you know, I love Jesus more than I love you. These days you say that, people will report you. But you know, I remember thinking, my grandmother really, 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 really loves me. Like, really loves me. I didn't think, oh my goodness, my heart is broken. She, she, she doesn't love me. That's not what I thought as a kid. You know what I thought? She must really, 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 really love Jesus. And that's what it's always been taught to us. My, my parents and my grandparents, even my great-grandparents, made sacrifices for the Lord, even in my life, making sacrifices to the Lord. You don't think I'd rather be at home with Aria and Jess right now? Missing, she's two. We miss these key moments sometimes. She has a lot of her first while I'm on the road preaching the gospel. But I counted the cost. I'm not being a martyr. I'm not complaining. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I'm telling you, I've counted the cost. And we like to compartmentalize things. Well, you know, we'll, we'll go to church as if it's a casual hobby, but we're not talking about being involved in ministry like it's charity or it's a hobby. I'm talking about devoting your life completely to Jesus. Giving up, giving up things. You know, when you got, when you got, when you got saved, you... You gave up a lot of your worldly friends. But when you start walking in the anointing, you lose all your lukewarm friends too. Not everyone can go to the top of the mountain with you. When you start to ascend that mountain of glory, you're going to have to leave some people in the valley. I thank God for divine connections. I thank Him more for divine disconnections. I'm going to surrender my life, everything I am to Him. We pour out ourselves because we know the time is short. You realize the time is short. <laughs> the time is short. The clock is ticking. Do you think when we stand before God that we'll say, Oh, I wish I had saved a little more money. Oh, I wish I had bought the second house. And none of these things are wrong. The Bible says the righteous leaves an inheritance for their children. And I understand that. But I'm talking about living with the mindset for eternity. I want to be able to stand before God and say, Lord, every instruction you gave me, I obeyed. And I did everything I could to win souls. Because that's the call. That's the cost. And there are things in us that we like to hang on to. We grip tightly and we just don't let him touch that area of our lives. People do it with sin all the time. They get offended. They blame the preacher for talking on the sin instead of themselves for committing it. Don't talk about what offends me. Don't touch what I want to keep. Don't challenge me in areas that I don't want to be challenged. And we convince ourselves of our own spirituality when in fact we're hiding behind religion, not letting him challenge us. We say things like, oh, you got to use wisdom. Hmm. 
fear often disguises itself as wisdom, you know. I want to abandon all that I am. Leave nothing, nothing left on the altar. People ask me, how do you keep a prayer life like you do? How do you stay in the Word? I make time for it. And my Jess and my Aria now is learning, but Jess knows and Aria is learning. When Dad is in the Word, he's, that's it. I'm in the Word. When I'm in prayer, I'm in prayer. And unless it's a medical emergency, I am not to be disturbed. Those are moments I give up. But you see, in surrendering to Christ in this way, I become the husband Jess needs me to be. In putting Jesus first, I become the father that Aria needs me to be. See, see, some of us, we didn't grow up with, with, with Christian parents. Some of us, you're the first, and you say, well, I wish I had that generation of blessing. I wish I had a godly heritage. You may not have had the godly heritage, but you can start it. One day they'll be telling stories about how grandma or grandpa surrendered everything. Radical surrender. And that's what I'm talking about. And one of these areas that I'm going to challenge you in tonight is the area of your money. Because Jesus talked about not being able to serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. This is why I can preach on almost anything else. But the moment I mention money, arms get folded. Ah, there's the catch. Even though it's one of the many things that happens in the service, that's why he's doing this. You do realize that it takes resources to keep things going. We, we don't hold the services to raise money. We raise money so we can keep holding the services. And you have to let God deal with that area. Especially now, because if we're not careful, we'll let the fear of the future keep us from being sacrificial and committing to the gospel. I can't let that go. They're talking about this in the economy and that. And, and what that's always been the case. Look back any time in our history and you will always see that everything's ready to collapse. And even if it did, who holds me? Even if it did, where was my faith in the first place? Situations like this show you where your faith was placed. Because if you're shaken because they're talking about economic systems, that shows you your faith was in a system and not in God. So we hold on to those things. I remember there was a season in my life where I justified that. I had my excuses too, believe me. Especially just starting in ministry. There was very little to go on. And I would say, say, say things like, well, I'm, I'm an evangelist, so, so technically it's like the Levites. The Levites didn't give their 10 in the, in the temple. And, and right, I had, I had my little mindsets that I had to work through. But it wasn't until I began to release that there was a flow that happened. What did Jesus say? He said, you give up these things. And he mentioned material things. Too. He mentioned houses and properties. And that means that he's talking about material things. There's nothing you can give up for the gospel. And the KJV says that you won't receive hundredfold. You won't receive it back in this life and the next. So, Brother David, are you preaching prosperity? Well, I'm certainly not preaching pro poverty. I don't believe in the name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, think it, and it's yours. I don't believe that, but I do believe what the Bible says. And just because some people abuse that doesn't mean we throw away the truths. I'm trying to help you here because I'm going to be fine. If, 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 if none of you give and this event isn't covered, God will raise someone else to do it. I, I'm walking in that kind of faith right now where, where I just know the Holy Spirit's going to take care of it. That's why we do these things. You know, this event costs $40,000 to put on. You say, how? It's everything you see because we take it to the world too, those watching online. It's a major, major undertaking. Travel and venue rentals and equipment rentals and personnel. You would be amazed at how quickly it all adds up. Hotels and meals and so forth. It all adds up. And so what I want to challenge you to do, people of God, is help us take the gospel to the nations of the world. What we're looking to do is not only cover the expenses, but also have surplus that we might put it into the next event. And I've been in services long enough to know that the resources are here tonight and from those who are watching online. So my challenge to you, we talk about surrender, we talk about giving things up, let it affect your finances too. 
And everyone gives in proportion to what they have. Remember the widow who came up and Jesus watched her give? She gives and Jesus praises her for giving everything that she had. Why? Because she gave in proportion to what she had. We're all going to have different proportions. Some of you, you're shaking putting $5 in the offering. And, 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 and that, may, that may sound somewhat humorous, but for some of you, that's not a joke. You're in a very serious situation and, and you're shaking putting it in. Some of us who are, who are doing better financially and then the wealthy, there's always that challenge to, well, you know, I'll just do it like a little token. Well, well just because you've done well doesn't mean that you're above the challenge to sacrifice. All of us are called to sacrifice. I'm not raising money for me. I'm raising it for Jesus. I'm raising it for his gospel. And I'm challenging you to not hold back from him for he's never held back from you. And we do it, why? So we can be blessed? Forget that. That's wonderful. He'll take care of it. Great. We know that we give so the gospel can go forward and so souls can be saved. So I want to challenge those of you online watching, and there are many of you, and I want to challenge those of you who are here to hear from the Holy Spirit. Let him speak to you. And sometimes he'll speak things that make you go, oh, no, that must not be God. It must not be God. Don't ignore him. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit. Anytime the Holy Spirit has spoken to me, just as the other day, and I'm saying this not to receive the praise of men, but just so you know, I do it too, and, and we're in this together. There, there was this need in, 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 in this other part of the world. People were suffering. I can't give much more detail than that. And we gave a very large portion to that organization because we were prompted by the Holy Spirit. But in doing that, there was return. You don't want to know the stories about how God's told me to give up camera equipment, the times he's told me to empty my bank account, the times he's told me to give even pieces of clothing and, and watches. I'm a watch collector. That some of my best watches I no longer have because the Holy Spirit. But you know... I can't say I regret it. So tonight we're going to give. And I challenge you to hear from the Holy Spirit something sacrificial, something that challenges you. Those of you who are, are well off, you have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you too. Not token giving, sacrificial. And so I want you to hear him out, ask him to speak to you, and let him, let him have his way. Those of you watching online, you can go to that link right there. And I'm going to ask all the ushers to come forward now. And what we're going to do is we're going to hand out stacks of envelopes. You're going to take an envelope, and then we're going to pass it down. And so everyone here is going to receive one. And I see the comments coming in from online. Thank you, all of you who are watching. I still, I'm still seeing born-again comments, thank God. So that's beautiful. But I can see people giving online. Those of you who are here. So guys, where, where are the envelopes? So, so don't pass the buckets yet. You're, what you're going to do is you're going to take an envelope and, and, and they're going to take one and hand it down. Thank you, my brother, for your help. Where are you from? Pardon? Oh, you're from here. Okay. So well, thank you for helping us. And can we hear it for all of our wonderful volunteers, church, who are supporting this great ministry through their time? And I'm looking online. I can see many people uh, giving sacrificially. I see a name... Um, Rosemary Tilly, God bless you. And then I see Nadine, I see Holly Lou and Jackie and our dear friends, the Patrick family. I see our dear friend Pam. You already know the drill, huh, Pam? You got, she has the link ready. And I got Yeleni. I see the Patrick family again. So many different gifts coming from online. Thank you for your support. Those of you watching online, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Give a one-time gift. And those of you who want to, in addition to giving a one-time gift, partner with us monthly. If you're writing out a check, make it payable to David Hernandez Ministries. And if you're going to use the envelope to give by card, we actually recommend instead that you go right there on that website. And then you don't even have to fill out the envelope. Right there, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Um, if you're giving by card, we recommend you do it online. It's a better system anyway as far as efficiency. But if you want to use the envelope for your check or cash giving or even your credit card giving, please hear me now. Make sure to fill out the envelope 
from start to finish, name, address, phone number, email, because we want to connect with you now and help us as we continue to take the gospel around the world. That connection is going to matter because we need each other in these days. Don't worry about the future. Don't fret about what's coming. Put your faith in God. He's going to take care of you. He will take care of the need. I see Monique and Autumn, and I see Janice, and I also see so many names coming, and I see uh, Maureen. God bless you. You just became a partner, actually. God bless you, Maureen. And I see those of you on YouTube giving Morgan, and I also see Christopher. So as the Holy Spirit leads you, let him speak to you. Give sacrificially something that will challenge your faith. And then in a moment, we're going to minister to those who need healing in their body. But we need to do this first. This is our duty as believers. This is something we must be committed to. We have to surrender every area of our lives, including this one. Give as the Holy Spirit leads. And he will use our resources to win souls, to build believers, to host events all around the world. This will be his doing. And we'll give him all the glory and the honor. How many of you need just a couple more minutes to fill out the envelope? Let me see. Okay, up here and then there in the back. We'll give you just a couple more minutes. Again, if you're filling out the envelope, make sure that you're filling out every bit of information because that's what we're going to use to contact you. We're going to show you where your support is going. And, and, and this way we'll be connected. We're going to be connected. And the Lord will connect us. And it will be something that he accomplishes through our partnership. And that is the winning of souls. So God bless you watching online. Those of you watching online, another way you can support, like, comment, and share. Like, comment, and share. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you want to see teachings on the Holy Spirit, spiritual warfare, prayer. You want to receive worship clips from our dear brother, Mr. Stephen Moctezuma. You want to see the power of the Holy Spirit in action. Then make sure that you subscribe. And when you do, click that notification bell so that you can receive notices whenever we release new content. How many of you here are subscribed, by the way? Let me see your hand. Okay, good portion of you. The rest of you need to repent and go and subscribe. I'm just kidding. Repent actually just means to change your mind. That's all. So change your mind and go and subscribe. But uh, those of you watching online, we encourage you, subscribe. You're going to love the content here. We're just getting started. We reached 300,000 subscribers as of yesterday, which is a wonderful milestone. And really, when you like, comment, and share, you're helping us to spread the, the gospel. Because when you like, comment, and share, YouTube loves that. So they, share your, they help to share your live stream everywhere. I'm still seeing generous, generous people. Uh, Jillian M. on YouTube, thank you so much. And then... Uh, Palacios, last name Palacios, thank you for your support. I see um, Mayo Chang Lee is also supporting. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, Wesley supporting. Mick Smith, Teresa, just so many generous givers. I wish I could read everyone's name, but it would, it would take much more time than we probably should give to it. But how many of you need more time to fill out this envelope? Anybody else? Okay, good. Here's what I want you to do. If you're giving tonight... I want you to hold up your gift like this. If you gave online, just hold up your empty hand like this. It's a, it's a digital gift, okay? And we're going to pray. Here's what we're going to pray. Yes, God's going to bless you. That's a given. Let's, let's not even worry about that. You're going to be blessed, okay? But let's pray that God would use these resources to win souls. Now, everybody pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Father, in the name of Jesus, we offer you, God, our resources. Because we trust you and because we love you, we lavish our gifts on you. And Lord, well, we know you're going to bless us and we thank you for it. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would use these resources as a weapon against the enemy. Use these resources to win souls around the world in the name of Jesus. Bless the giving. Let it be multiplied. And Father, give our ministry wisdom in stretching every dollar to affect the world with the gospel in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Please stand to your feet as Steve Moctezuma comes to you lead us in worship. Worthy of it all. We say together, you are you are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. The glory. We sing together. You are, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. To you are all things. Oh, Ray. 
be seated this evening. I want to stir your faith a little before we minister to the sick, and this will be just a few minutes now. I can sense the shift in the room happening, and miracles are about to take place in this room. Miracles are about to take place. It's the nearness of Jesus that brings forth miracles. It's his healing presence. It's his healing presence. Thank you, Ish. The healing presence of Jesus brings forth healing. I want to be very clear tonight that if you came here expecting a miracle, your miracle is not going to be found in the touch of a man. Your miracle is not found in the name of David Hernandez. There's only one healer here tonight, and his name is Jesus. Don't look for a touch from a person. Don't look for a touch from a human being. When you look to Jesus tonight, you'll be made whole. But in asking God to heal you, there's something you must know that will bring forth the miracle. Often when Jesus would heal the sick, he would make it very clear as to why they were healed. He would say to them on many accounts again and again, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. There have been moments when I've prayed for the sick through the laying on of hands. And as I'm laying hands on that sick person, I can see the power of God moving up and down their body. There's a heat that they can feel. Electricity is pulsing up and down their being. They're trembling, shaking, crying. Some of them having put, put down their walkers. Some of them having gotten out of wheelchairs. And sometimes it, it happens like this. To where we're praying for their miracle. They're receiving their miracle. And I say, what is God doing for you? And they say, there's still pain in my ankle. I'm thinking, you're in the wheelchair. You've been there for 10 years. You haven't stood up like this in 10 years. You haven't had feeling in your legs. The power of God is all over you. You're trembling, you're shaking, you sense his presence, and you're focused on the little bit of pain left in your ankle. It's human nature. I can see why God repented that he made man. Sometimes dealing with people is a little frustrating. Or they'll come, and they'll stand at this, this section right here, and they'll, they'll stand there, and everyone else is hands lifted, eyes closed, praying, and they're like this looking at me. Watching my movement. Just so you know, I purposefully skip those. Do you know why? Because they're not looking to Jesus. They're looking to me. And there's nothing I can do for them. Or they'll come to the front. And they'll say, okay, just do your thing. And I'm like, this is not like a clinic where you come in and I, I do my thing. There has to be faith present. There has to be something for God to work with. Or the moment that we're worshiping and the power of God moves through the room. Thoughts are going through people's minds. And instead of stepping out in faith, they just leave it as is. Some even have sicknesses that they've had for so long that they don't even believe God can heal them. And they've accepted their sickness as a part of their personality. What I'm saying to you is simple. You want to be healed tonight. you got to touch Him in faith. You've got to reach out and touch them in faith. It's just that simple. There are no gimmicks. There are no special prayers. There is no process. If you followed me for any length of time or the teachings that I put out, you know I don't believe in renouncing this or that or the other. Jesus never did. I don't need to know the name of your demon to cast it out. I don't need to know the name of your sickness to cast it out. I don't need to know the story and how you've been hurt for so many years and how so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. Neither does Jesus. It's one touch and you're made whole. (laughs) 
One touch from his presence. One touch from his power. And you're made completely whole. But in order to receive that healing touch, there must be faith present. And no, you're not begging him. I've also seen some, as we're worshiping and praying, God can't move on them because they're so focused on themselves. God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please. If begging would have done it, there'd be no faith needed. You're a child of God. You don't need to beg. The healing power of God is present, and he can make you whole. There's no need to beg. It's his presence. When the faith for the miracle meets the power to perform it, the miracle is done. And you will experience this healing touch tonight. And it will be a moment you never forget. But you can't be so wrapped up in yourself and your own emotions that you miss him. We're so conditioned and we need mindsets to be broken. In my observation when praying for the sick, I've also noticed that they'll come up and they'll want to go down the checklist. Can you pray for me to be healed? What do you need? My eyes. Let's pray. Oh, wow, I can see. Now can you pray for my shoulder? Now can you pray for my elbow? Now can you pray for my... I'm telling you, one touch and you'll be completely made whole. You know why, you know why that is? Because we limit him. We limit him to one thing at a time. But he can do it all in an instant. No matter how many years you've been dealing with that sickness, that sickness must bow to the Lordship of Christ. <laughs> the scripture often describes Jesus' healing ministry. Acts 10, 38, you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Matthew 4, 23, Jesus traveled to the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom, and he healed every kind of illness and disease. Matthew 9, 35, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom, and he healed every kind of sickness and disease. It repeats it again. Matthew 12, 15. But Jesus knew what they were planning. So he left that area and many people followed him. And he healed all the sick among them. I love the way the King James Version words it. As many as touched him were made whole. In my observation, I've also noticed that many people... Have faith for the future, never for the moment. They believe their miracle is some distant thing in the future because it's easier to believe that something may happen one day than it is to believe that it's going to happen right now. We're waiting for the setting to be right. We're waiting for the music to be just so. We're waiting for it to feel a certain way. How do you know that tonight is not the night you'll receive your healing? How do you know that tonight is not the night that after years and years of suffering, you'll finally receive that miracle for which you've prayed all this time? I was praying for a man here, right in, this, this, in, in, in Orlando. He was in a wheelchair, paralyzed from the waist down. No movement, no filling, no calf muscles. Praying for him... I recognized that he was struggling with this faith. I told him, Jesus wants to make you whole now. Not in the distant future when the moment is right. Not some way, somehow. Not someday when I get to heaven. Now. Church, that man began to move his legs. That man had movement restored. And as I stand before God, I tell you the truth. 
That man regrew muscle in his legs right then and there. There's nothing too hard for God. I'm telling you, the moment is now. But when you pray, don't beg. You're a child of God. When you pray, don't get all wrapped up in the emotion of it. When you pray, and please forgive me for saying it this way, I, I don't want to say it, and people misunderstand what I'm saying. I don't want you to think I'm lacking in compassion for you. I'm telling you this because I care. When you pray, please don't get caught up in feeling sorry for yourself. Because that too is a distraction. Just focus on Him. Know that He is the healer. Know that He is the one who makes you whole. How many right now can sense faith in the room? Let me see your hand. Lift your hands, pray in the Holy Ghost. As many as touched him were made whole. As many as touched him were made whole. You're in this place. Jesus to heal you. He's going to make you whole. Pray in the Holy Ghost, church. Pray in the Holy Ghost just a moment. Everyone stand to your feet, please. Jesus. Forget about your sickness for a moment. Forget about yourself. And just lift your hands and love them. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, my friend, will you come and reveal Jesus to these people? Will you come and make your presence so real that they can't deny it? Will you come and give us the faith for the miraculous?
told to be quiet. Don't be quiet. Cry out. Cry out. Lift your hands and call upon the name of Jesus right now. Come on. Lift your hands and call upon the name of Jesus. Sing with everything that you have. I love you. I love you. Hands lifted now, eyes closed. Whether you're here in person or watching online, Jesus wants to make you whole. So in this moment now, I want you to see through the eyes of faith. He's present. present in the room with you. Jesus himself is walking up and down these aisles, placing his hand on you. Holy Spirit, help us to see him now. Help us to see him now. High and lifted up. Jesus, we look to you, Son of the living God. Resurrected Lord. Pour out your healing virtue in this place. These are your people, Lord. They're your children. Touch them now. Oh, just lift your hands and ask. Just ask Him to heal you. Ask Him to heal you. He's doing it. And make it your declaration of faith. You are the God that healeth me. 
You are the Lord, my healer. You sent your word. You sent your word and healed my disease. Lifted talent, church. You are the God. You are the God that He left me. You are the Lord, my healer. You sent your word and healed my disease. lifted you are the God you are the God that he left me you are the Lord my healer you sent your word and healed my disease the Lord, my so we declare it, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, I stand in that authority now. And I declare in the name of Jesus, every sickness and every disease goes now. We take authority. I just sense the wind of the Spirit blow through this place. Some of you are healed even now. You may not even realize it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Place your hand on your sickness now, church. This is the moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that sickness. And I command right now, healing virtue will begin to flow. I cast out every devil of sickness now. And I plead the blood of Jesus upon everyone present in this room. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke cancer now. In the name of Jesus, Arthritis goes. Backs be made whole. Completely restored right now. I command movement in arms and legs and hands and fingers to be restored in this very moment. Blind eyes open in Jesus' name. Deaf ears open in Jesus' name. Agree with me now, church, as we pray against sickness and disease. Nervous system be made whole. Digestive system be made whole. Paralysis go. Tumors go. Growths go. Someone in here. There's a skin disease on the top of your head. It's caused you to lose hair and there's like a, a dryness and an itchiness to that, that, that's something on your scalp. I rebuke that now in Jesus' name. You'll be healed right this moment. There's a couple here tonight. You're believing God to bless you with a child. But the doctors told you that wasn't possible. 
I speak life to that womb right now in the name of Jesus. I speak life to that womb in the name of Jesus. Someone, there's a tumor on your kidney, a tumor on your kidney. I believe that's someone watching live. I rebuke that tumor in the name of Jesus. Keep praying in the Holy Ghost, church. Someone to my right, severe neck injuries being healed. I thank you, Lord. Also, someone to my right, an ear infection is being healed. Thank you, Jesus. Paralysis and numbness in the hand and fingers is being healed in this room tonight. Thank you, Lord. There's a young girl who came here tonight battling heavily with depression. And the enemy has been assaulting your mind where you've been contemplating suicide. The power of the enemy is broken over you tonight. You're made whole in Jesus' name. Church, would you lift your hands? Miracles are happening all over. Receive yours. Someone else, uh, a dislocated kneecap is being healed. Someone else, dis something, something wrong with the kneecap. I don't know quite how to describe it or what I'm seeing, but the kneecap is being healed. Thank you, Lord. I honor you. Holy Spirit, reveal as you're doing. A skin disorder is being healed. It's disappearing right now. Someone with a severe skin disorder, check your skin. God's healing you right now. God's healing you right now. Glaucoma to my left. Someone, glaucoma is being healed right now. I thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for these miracles. And we pray that you give us the faith to receive. I command backs be healed. I command arms and legs be healed. Movement be restored. Pain go. What I want you to do is begin to do what you could not do before. Test the miracle. Test the miracle. If you're in this place and you couldn't move your shoulder, move your shoulder. You couldn't move your leg, move your leg, your neck, move your neck. Test your eyes and your ears. Right now is the moment. Step out in faith. Quickly, quickly, quickly now. Something is happening in this room. I'm telling you, church. Step out in faith. God is doing it. If you needed a crutch or a walker, begin to step out in faith. If you needed a wheelchair, begin to step out in faith. You're going to find that the healing miracle is done. Keep praying. Someone with ulcers in their mouth, you've just been healed. I thank you, Lord. Somebody with ulcers in their mouth has just been healed. I thank you, Jesus. Father, we honor you. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. Come, Holy Spirit, and do as only you can do. I thank you, Father, for these miracles. I thank you, Lord, that you're healing paralysis. I thank you, Lord, that you're healing arthritis. I thank you, Lord, that you're restoring movement in the name of Jesus. Now, how many of you in this place, as we began to pray, you experienced a miracle? Wave at me if you experienced a miracle in your body all over, all over the room. Just wave at me, wave at me, wave at me. Look at all these people whom God has healed. Now listen to me, I need you to do me a favor because you're going to help a lot of people right now. If you just waved at me because you experienced a miracle, would you please come out of your seat right now and come line up on this side where they're waving you down? Come now, please. Come, come, come. If you waved, come. Don't be shy. Don't worry. I promise you it's going to encourage people and God's going to use your testimony. God's going to use your testimony. Patrick, quickly, please. Look, there's a flow here, and we have to move with it. There's a flow here, and we have to move with it. Look at all these miracles, church. What a mighty God we serve. Anybody else? God's healed you. If God healed you, get out of your seat, come and testify. We want to share what the Lord is doing. And as they're preparing those testimonies, I want every hand lifted as we sing hallelujah.
take your seats. Patrick, if we can, please move this table and please don't lose my iPad. All the sermons are on there. No, I won't need it back tonight. I have, I think, like 400 sermons on that thing. And like two-thirds of them are about the Holy Spirit. I'll give you the phone for now, Steve. I may need it in a moment to talk to our YouTube people. All right, Mr. Vargas, what happened here? Hey, David, I have Stephanie here. For three years now has been dealing with PCOS, basically a stomach pain that comes and goes. And tonight, earlier when you were ministering and you had said, is there anything that God cannot do? She said she began to become overwhelmed with just joy. She said she felt the presence of God come upon her. And she said when that happened, she felt the pain lift off her. And she said now she has no more pain. And was pain the only symptom of that? So, no. Sometimes, like, if anyone's familiar with PCOS, it's been going on longer than three years. But I'd like miss my menstruals and hormonal imbalance. And I'd always feel like a pain in my ear whenever, like, like monthly. And how bad is that pain usually? It's an irritating pain. It just comes and I have to bear with it. It's just like, like a squeezing of my, this is like an internal squeezing. But now I can't feel it anymore. And I came in with it. So how did it happen for you? You're worshiping the Lord and he healed you? What was that like? Yeah, so my parents are Nigerian and they knew like, this, is there anything that God cannot do? And then that reminded me of a song that we sing in, like, in my Nigerian church. And I started singing it and I got overwhelmed with joy. Like, Lord, you didn't, you didn't make me to be a vessel of sickness. So I know, I know that I'm standing here and I know the God that I serve and you didn't make me to be a vessel of any sickness. So that's what brought me so much joy. Then I felt God's presence over me and I just like, I just could just stand, I couldn't say anything, like just stand there. What did it feel like? It felt like a, this is where I'm supposed to be, like a wholesome feeling. Like you're just speechless and you just allow God to do his work, like a covering. Like an assurance, I can sense him here with us. Can you sense him with us? He's standing on the platform with us. It's overwhelming, isn't it? Now you look at that face. She's experiencing Holy Spirit ecstasy. It's this sense of euphoria. It's overwhelming joy and love. It's real. Lift your hands. God wants to use you. Father, take the prayers of her parents and manifest them in this moment now. That's the glory of God. That's the glory of God. Something's happening here. If you want that too, you lift your hands and ask him to fill you. Come on. Lord, touch your people, I pray. And Lord, awaken the prophetic anointing on her life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And God's people said... Now someone help her to her seat if you can. Good luck, Matthew. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's the presence of the Holy Ghost, church. Okay, Reuben, what happened? David, David, I have Jordan here. About two, three years ago, he fell and he hurt his wrist. 
And he said, his whole mindset the whole time was, God won't heal the little small, the small things. And he said, tonight his mind shifted. He said, no, God can't do it. God will heal me. And he said, when he began to tell the people to begin to move and do what they couldn't do anymore, he said he began to believe that his, his wrist would be healed. And tonight his wrist is healed. He so you no came with the mindset saying, God's not going to heal this because it's too small. Yeah. And then what happened? So um, when you just said, that, just start believing for your miracle, I just put my hand up in the air. And I just started moving it until I started hearing popping. And then it stopped popping and you said, test it. So I, I was doing everything to it. What do, you mean, what do you mean you were doing everything to it? You were trying to find the popping? No, I was, because I, I wouldn't be able to bend my wrist that far. Um, so basically, I was trying to like see how far I could push it until it started hurting and it doesn't hurt at all. And how long had, had you been dealing with that pain again? So since I was... Um, I fell in middle school, but it didn't start happening, and happening until I started training um, in high school, and, and, and now I'm, I got my, I'm getting my associates now, so it's been that long ago. So how many years would that be? Um, I'd say about at least four years or so, with just a small pain, but now it's gone, so. The scripture says, he delights in every detail of our lives. Isn't that like Jesus to take care of those little things? Lift your hands. What's your name, brother? You want God to use you? Do you sense his presence here and now? Then Father, use Jordan for your glory in Jesus' name. Leave him there, Pat. Hey, no, no, no. Leave him there. Leave him there. Leave him there. His legs kind of just gave out on him there. Come here, Jordan. That's the glory of God on you. Father, double portion, double portion anointing in Jesus' name. What, what are you feeling on you right now? <laughs> I, I'm shaking right now. <laughs> Say again. I can't stop laughing. Well, that's the glory of God on you, man. That's the joy of the Spirit right there. Hey, stretch your hands toward him. Keep praying for him. Okay, hold on. I asked him, has this ever happened to you? And you're saying, what? There was a time you had a video about receiving the Holy Spirit. And I couldn't stop laughing while I was praying in the Spirit. Through the YouTube video, guys. So, Lord anoint him and use him and mark him for life in Jesus name in Jesus name leave him there a second leave him there a second there uh, there's well if you can get up Jordan this guy's help him down help him down Pat because there's there's a there's a real flow of God's power here tonight isn't this awesome all right, Mr. Vargas, what's going on? David, I have Andrea here for about four to five months now. She's been dealing with a sharp abdominal pain now. And she said, earlier today when you led the crowd to, be, to pray over whatever it is they needed a healing for, she felt this pressure come upon her. And then she said, after you were done praying, it was like a release came off her. And she said, that moment she felt the release come off her, the pain left. And she has no more pain after four to five months. Four to five months of that abdominal pain. Did you know what it was? Kind of made you nervous, I'm sure. It, was, it felt like sharp pains, and I didn't know what it was. But Jesus makes you whole. Jesus makes you whole. Jesus makes you whole. Lift your hands. Don't be afraid. Sometimes people get a little nervous with it. But that's okay. That's the power of God on her. Look at this, church. That's a moment that'll mark her. That's a moment that will mark her. You see, to us, we, we hear these testimonies and we think, oh, how wonderful, and we applaud, and it's somewhat entertaining to us. But do you realize this is someone who's going to go home today, and she's not going to have to worry about that pain that she's been feeling for months. She's going to go home healed, well, because Jesus made her home. Now you go rejoicing. And you make sure to tell people what Jesus did for you. Will you do that? 
What's your name? Andrea. Andrea. Well, God bless you. You go rejoicing in your miracle. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for that? All right, Reuben. David, I have Isaiah here. Four to five months now has had this terrible pain in his throat, which has caused him to not even breathe properly, eat food any, or any of that. And he said he, he has no idea what caused it. He thinks, he thinks it's just a overuse of his voice. And he said tonight when you led the crowd to pray, he said he felt this pressure come on upon him as well. And then it released off him. He said it feels normal now. After four to five months, it feels normal. It's not just physical. There's an assault on your life to keep you from fulfilling God's call to preach the gospel. God has called you. Even now I can see it in you. The anointing of the Holy Ghost. Their prayers will not fall to the ground. Lift your hands. Isaiah, get ready. God's going to use your life. Stretch your hands toward him, church. Lord, help him receive your power today. Help him receive your power today. Thank you, Jesus. I feel, it's, it's okay, it's okay. I feel like a weight, a weight, a weight. A weight of God's glory here. How many can sense that on the room? I want to say this just because I have to make sure I give glory where it's due. And if you think I overdo it, oh well. This is not me. This is who's around me. This is the Holy Spirit, my friend, who I follow, who I walk with, and who I know. You've heard me talk about him. That's him in the room with us. It's him in your seat with you. It's the Holy Spirit. Isaiah, listen to me now. God wants to use your life. Do you believe that? And you'll let him use it. Surrender your life. He's going to do great things with you. Stay on the path. Stay on path. God bless you. Reuben, what's going on here? David, I have Aaliyah here. Last year, August, she had gone into an accident where she popped her kneecap. That late, later that month, she had to go undergo surgery. Ever since she had that surgery, her right leg has felt weak. It's been minor pain. And she said today she felt like it just strengthened. Like it just feels as equal as the left leg now. Were you the one I called out when I was calling out a kneecap? Was that you? She says, maybe. Well, did your kneecap get healed? There you go. And what, and what was the pain like? Hard to explain? Are you a little shy being up here right now? Yeah, okay, I can tell. I won't ask you too many questions then. Just close your eyes, lift your hands. Forget about the people for a moment. Jesus. There's such an anointing here right now. Sing it, Steve. She said, when David said, uh, when you pointed out the person with the kneecap, she goes, oh, that was me. She that said, was you, the said, kneecap. That was, that was me. She That's said, why you hesitated. <laughs> where did she go? I don't even know where she went. Oh, you. You were right to hesitate, I suppose. And then you, the moment that was pointed out, what happened? 
Uh, she said she felt uh, just pain, this pain come off her leg. She said she's had this pain on her left knee now for a long time. She said just from wear and tear from being in track in high school. And she said the doctor diagnosed her. She said it's normal. But she said tonight I'm believing for my healing. And when you said that, she said she started praying. And then she said the pain left. Right, right before you uh, pointed out the kneecap, I'm like, Lord, tell them about my kneecap. Tell them about my kneecap. And then, <laughs> and then you know, not long after that, you said it. So. <laughs> so you told the Lord, talk about my kneecap. And then he told me, talk about the kneecap. And I talked about the kneecap. And you received your miracle. That's how the Holy Spirit works. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then when you told me to try it, I'm like, okay, yeah, let's try it. So I, I got up. I, I sat down, then I got up, and it didn't hurt as bad. How about now? Go ahead and move your leg. She says it feels fine now. I, can, I mean, I can walk and stuff like that. I'm, I'm fine, but it's when it comes to like climbing up steps. Or... Say again. No pain. No pain. I just see the joy of the Lord all over you, Lord. Touch her. I thank you for this miracle. Thank you, Jesus, for touching her body. Now, Father, touch her with your power, I pray. Overwhelm her. Don't worry. Don't worry. Just receive. Just receive. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's a real... As I'm praying for you, everyone stretch your hands toward her. She's a little nervous with it. Don't apologize. I understand. Different people react differently to it. Holy Spirit, come like a wind. Sweep her legs out from under her. Sweep her legs out from under her. <laughs> the power's flowing, and what happens is sometimes they go like, oh, oh. I've had people even pull me down with them sometimes. But it's his power and he's moving. Okay, Ruben, what's going on here? David, I have Kamal here. Uh, about two months ago, he was uh, in an incident where he was attacked by people and uh, they left him on Say the street. Say that again more clearly, start over. About two months ago, Kamal here was attacked in New York by some people and uh, he was left for dead. He has surgery, there's stitches on his, on his head right now on his scalp, you can see it. And he said ever since then, um, he's had terrible uh, issues with his memory, his clarity, all that has been a problem with for him, even pain all, as well in his head. And he said, tonight, he, uh, he said, I was able to think perfectly. He said, the whole... Remember what I told you earlier about these types of miracles we've been seeing. So explain it to me again. You, you were attacked and left for dead? For dead. You know, he thought I was dead, so he left. And the only way, the only explanation I can give to any logical thinking human being is when they were planning to kill me, God was also planning. And here I am. Now, after the attack, you experienced problems with clarity. Explain that to me. L lack of memory. When I walk, my foot would, you know, miss my steps. And uh, the swinging will be like terrible. And the headache, problems sleeping. But all of a sudden here tonight, what I have experienced is nothing short and, you know, miraculous. You know, I feel it's clarity, it's my memory is like, okay, I'm feeling, you know, myself again, so to speak. You know, I'm just feeling the way I always used to feel. Now, did you come with anyone tonight? I'm with a brother and I would like... <coughs> Is he here? Come, 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 come. And you're, you're his biological brother or a brother in the Lord? Okay, come. You were saying... I like to say thank you. Well, it was done. In the name of Jesus, thank you. If it wasn't for you... I wouldn't be standing here today. I would be in some cuckoo house in New York or in some places where the Veteran Administration wants to send me. You got to be there for three months before they could help you. While I was bleeding, I was in pain, 
You know, I was almost, uh, you know, like a, like a crazy guy. You know, what's going on? I'm bleeding, I'm hurting, why you people can't take care of me? I went to three hospitals. And of the three hospitals, each one of those three hospitals sent me home bleeding in pain. They packed my nose with a balloon and I was bleeding from my mouth. So finally, when it starts the second time when I get the attack again when I was bleeding, I called the ambulance and I said, you know what? You're gonna take me to the Manhattan VA where I'm calling a taxi and I'm going myself. While I was bleeding profusely, these people were, you know, debating, oh, it's too far away and this and that. But the, the thing is that when they took me to Manhattan V, my experience with the veteran hospital in Manhattan, for since 1983 I've been going there, was nothing but positive. And in 20 minutes, a young doctor began to troubleshoot, see what was going on. In 20 minutes, they stopped the bleeding. And I got really well. My brother called me on the phone. He was praying, and I know from his heart, the way he was crying, and the way he was, you know, he was there for you. He was there for you. And you were saying? David, I was watching your show, and I was praying for this guy. I guess he didn't accept Jesus Christ. Um, and I was praying for him during one of your um, revival shows. It was about three weeks ago. And in the middle of it, he called me. And he said, I'm ready to come to the water. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for that? I mean, as, as you can tell, church, he's, he's telling us about his journey. He's telling us about what he's gone through. And I think that's important to hear because we only see the moment, not the moments leading up to this. This man has gone through a lot, as you just heard, and he tried many different things. But tonight, Jesus touched him and made him whole. While you were praying for hard hearts and families to be, um, you know, to, to come to Jesus and receive salvation, he called me. And that's when we started praying on the phone with him. Because I told him to get down your knees. And we went through it. He just did here today. So, so saved and healed. Well, God bless you both. Go rejoicing in your miracle. What happened here, Reuben? David, I have Christina here. 21 years ago, she had to go under sur undergo surgery on her shoulder. And then she, uh, ever since that surgery, she has this chronic dislocation, constant pain in her shoulder, always there, never going. And then she said uh, tonight, she said she felt the Lord come upon her and, and touch her shoulder. And she said, when you were praying, she said she, she saw like a vision of God's hand come upon her shoulder and this power just be released on her shoulder and the pain left. And what, and what was wrong with your shoulder? I had chronic dislocation for um, over 20 years. I had chronic dislocation. And tonight? And tonight the Lord healed me. How do you know? Because he touched me, he poured his spirit out on me, and I was able to move it in ways I haven't been. For how long? For 21 years. 21 years. You haven't been able to move it like that. Well, show off what God has done for you. Wow. So, Lord, we thank you for this miracle. Release your power. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Wow. What are you sensing on you right now? <laughs> That'll tell you right there what she's sensing. <laughs> oh, wow. Hey, do me a favor, guys. I sense a flow changing. We'll do one more, but, but Matthew and Britton get all of their contact information. I want you all to testify tomorrow night, okay? But Ruben, what happened here? And then we're gonna go in the direction as the spirit leads. Ruben, what happened? <laughs> she was hesitant. She was like, I'm not sure if I should go up there. This Christy, she's had back pain for, for how many years now? I'm sorry? I, and I have another one coming up on June 17th for another fusion. And um, my neck has also been bothering me. I have a disc problem. But when we were praying, I just felt the presence, like this energy, hot and cold at the same time, going by me, and my neck released. Now... We'll see about my back, but I don't have the pain. And it, I mean, it's nine o'clock, and usually by now I'm on an ice pack or eating or something. So I'm just 
It's the presence of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your power flowing through here. <laughs> That's the power of God. Lift your hands, pray in the Holy Spirit. And those of you who are watching online as the Lord heals you, make sure you're testifying in the comment section about what he's doing. Tune in tomorrow night, Sunday night. We're going to be live again, 6 p.m. That is Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tune in tomorrow night. I know the Lord's going to touch you again. Thank you for watching. And until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. God bless you.